All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome. So today I'm going to be giving a bit of a deeper dive than I have before into Catello applicability. Um, so just for an intro, why do we even need this new Catello applicability? Well, from our upgrade from Pulp 2 to Pulp 3, um, the ability to calculate which packages need updates um, fell onto Catello because it no longer really made sense for Pulp to care about what hosts are available or what hosts are on the machine um, or what they used to be called were, uh, were consumers. Um, and we realized that we could calculate it very easily in Catello with all the data that we had um, with just a little bit more arranging of data uh, in a way to make our calculations faster. So we started to make Catello applicability for our move to Pulp 3. Um, multiple people have been using it so far, and it looks like it's been working well. So here we are. All right, so see, uh, we well, shall start. Um, I'm just going to give a quick overview about what applicability is, just to get everyone on the same page. So if you're using Catello, um, applicability describes what packages need updates. And if you're using yum content, um, that is typically communicated through errata. So you can, you'll see something on your host at the top of there, installable errata, you'll see some security bug fix enhancements, et cetera. Those are just the categories. Um, and then you'll see a list of the errata with their IDs. You'll see their title, their issue date, all that good stuff. Um, but errata applicability is really driven by package applicability, which is kind of the core um, of applicability. Everything else sort of stems from that for now. So you'll see something like an upgradable package on the bottom there. That uh, Walrus 5.21 is included in the uh, C erratums package list, which is why they both pop up. Um, in this case, I think as installable, um, which is a difference that I'll get to in a second. Um, now, package applicability, I said it's kind of the core. Um, it drives errata applicability, and right now it also drives module applicability uh, for young content. Um, and I'm just going to really be speaking, mostly my examples will be towards YUM applicability, because that's uh, just personally what I'm, what I have experience with. Okay, so I mentioned that there is a thing of installable versus applicable errata. Um, just wanted to mention this too, just for some helpful background information. Um, installable means it's uh, immediately available to your host. Um, it exists in your host environment, you can just click apply errata and it'll apply it over from execution or however you want. But then applicable is slightly different. It means that it's available in the library repos that are available to your host, but not necessarily in the environment. So maybe you did some filtering or something like that um, and you accidentally filtered out these new packages that need updates. Um, so then what you would do there is, again, if you did it through the UI, you would click apply the errata and Catello would do an incremental update to add your content to the environment um, via a new content view version with um, like a point release. And then you'd install your packages. Um, yep, so that's all I need to say there. So this kind of gets us to how we start thinking, how we started to think about making, designing this new Catello applicability. Um, so with the background info in mind, when do we need to calculate applicability for hosts? And there's a few cases here. So firstly, a host, when it uploads a new package profile, and that's when you do essentially anything with YUM. Um, often, usually the case would be installing or removing an RPM or doing a YUM update or whatever. Um, the host will upload a new package profile and then that host will need its applicability regenerated because something changed. The other time when we calculate applicability um, is when a library repository's content changes. So when you sync a repo and some new packages come in or some packages leave, 
we need to regenerate the applicability for all of the hosts that are even related to that repository. And that could potentially be many hosts, depending on setups. Yeah, it could be thousands. Um, so as part of this design, it was important to make sure that that wouldn't be a massive hit to the system. And then lastly, a user can also manually request a calculation. And these are all times that a host could be requested to have their applicability recalculated. And these can all happen at the same time, too, which is an important thing to know. And then some folks might be thinking about content view versions. And that's not something we have to worry about, because applicability is based on the library content. Um, the content view versions are what to just determine if it's installable or applicable. So at least we don't really have to worry about that. So with these things in mind, we need to talk about kind of the asynchronous requirements of Catello applicability. Um, so yeah, as we learned from the last slide, the calculation requests can come in often and from many different sources. So that comes up with a couple interesting points. So our first thought was, well, like the easiest solution would be just kick off a new Dyneflow task as soon as um, some applicability request comes in. It could be for one host, it could be for many hosts. If it's for many hosts, if it's for like 10,000, we could even split that off into different tasks. Um, but the main issue there is first, well, there's two main issues. Firstly, Dyneflow has some overhead to it. So if we got a whole bunch of requests to calculate one host, there would be quite a bit of overhead and it would be best if those calculations were to happen in a single Dyneflow test, um, or at least within multiple concurrent Dyneflow tests, um, or I should say concurrent Dyneflow actions within one task. That's, that's what we really want. And then there's another problem with that. Um, Let's say these three different sources fire off at once, and and when I mention the three sources, I mean the the three that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, each one could contain the same host in it, so you'd have three requests for a particular host, and it could even be for many other hosts. So we needed to duplicate that. Um, and essentially, what that led us to was a system where we queue up all of the host requests. Um, and then we can split them among Dyneflow tasks. So the, the hosts will fill up this queue. Every time a host comes in, you'll have a new um, event that'll trigger a task to consume from that queue. So you never really have to worry about um, having the overhead from a bunch of Dyneflow tasks that only consume one host. Um, and I will show you what this looks like on this next page. Um, we have a block diagram here of how the applicability actually works. Um, so essentially the order of operations here is we have um, a repo or a host applicability regeneration task come in. The task will pop one host if it's just a single host applicability task or a whole bunch if it's a repository, and that will fill up the host queue. And then we'll also pop on an event onto the event queue, and that event is what triggers the Dyneflow task to actually do um, the applicability calculations. And then this event queue, as the event queue works, will pop off um, a generate host applicability event. And then that, or sorry, I say, yeah, it'll pop off the generate host applicability event, which will trigger um, the, the bulk generate action, um, which will pop hosts off the queue and then process them. So you see there's this applicability batch size. It will pop off whatever you have that setting set to, and I'll talk a bit about tuning that later. Um, it'll pop off that many hosts and then create um, an applicability generation option. And it'll keep doing that until the queue is empty. Um, and at the same time, when we do this, we also prune the queue of any duplicate hosts. So we don't uh, generate it more than once. 
And that way we can firstly ensure the host queue never has any hosts left over um, because that would be a design flaw. And we can also make sure that there is an appropriate amount of tasks not for each dime flow action that runs. And the default that we have for the applicability batch size is 50. So that's essentially one dime flow task per 50 hosts um, if you're running the default. OK, so that is our block diagram for how the applicability works. Now we can look a bit into how um, we actually do this calculation. I'm not going to dig too, too deep into the code, but I think the most interesting thing here is the new uh, Postgres EVR extension. So back when we decided we could take on doing this applicability goodness, um, we have this EVR extension, or we knew that we had all of the data, but what we didn't know, or what we didn't have at the time was a good way to quickly make, run queries against this data, which is the, the Epic version and release at our part of an RPM. So I was having a quick example here, this OS info DB RPM. You can see there's this ugly string, which is, which is the EVR. It looks really ugly in Ruby, um, but, Essentially, it's three data fields. It's the epic, which is always an integer, so it's zero here because we don't see it at all in the RPMs field there. And then there's the version, which gets split up by integers and text. And then there's the release, which also gets split up. And then this ends up being a very nice field in Postgres to do comparisons. And the uh, the extension that we have in Postgres enables us not to have to do really any code in Catello to, to set this up. We just have to use it. The only setup is uh, the migration that creates the triggers that ensures that this stays up to date on both the Catello RPMs and the installed packages field. So comparing the EVRs really is quite simple. Um, this is a join that is part of our larger query that we do to determine what your applicable RPMs are. And we do a join on the Catello installed packages field because we want to see which RPMs are will update the installed packages. And we just match it on the name and the architecture. And we just use that greater than symbol to look for the greater EVR. And it just works out, um, which simplifies things greatly. Because these queries, even with the EVR, are already pretty complicated. Um, and if anyone ever look, wants to look at the code, you can always ask me questions about it um, outside of this presentation. OK, so that's all I was going to mention about Postgres EVR. We also have applicability tuning, like I mentioned. Um, it's this applicability batch size. And I would recommend tuning it, or at least trying to give it a tune, um, if you have many, many hosts, thousands. And a good way to tune it would just be to um, start with a small number, I don't know, maybe 25, or you could even start with 50, um, and then work your way up, and then each time run an applicability generation event um, on some large number of hosts, or perhaps all of them. And then if you graph it out, you could see for your own system what works best. This seemed like a, a good value um, for default, but I think tuning it for your system could lead to some good results. Um, and it shouldn't take too long either. Oh, and just keep in mind with the tuning that so a smaller batch size will result in more concurrent time flow actions. Um, and the calculations are sequential within one bulk generate time flow action. And then I just have some debugging info that may be helpful. So if you ever want to check the number of hosts on your queue, if you were questioning if they were being processed correctly, you could run this um, queue depth command from the console. You can also generate applicability for any number of hosts that you want by throwing or by using this trigger applicability generation method with all your host IDs in the console that will pop, they'll push it onto the queue and make the, uh, the generate applicability event for you. And then 
if you also just need to try spawning an applicability event by itself. Um, this was helpful in the past, and we were trying to figure out um, if uh, the applicability events were even working because the queue had leftover hosts. You could just throw an event on there, let it run, and see that the host queue goes back to zero. Um, that shouldn't be a problem anymore, but if it is, you have these options here to debug it. All right, and that took a little longer than I expected, but that is it. Um, so let me know if you have any questions, and thank you. Cheers, Ian. So, questions, guys? Jaskaran, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, yes. Um, um, that was an amazing presentation. I just wanted to ask one thing, and that is, when you say we can tune the batch size uh, from even for these systems, yeah, for these systems where uh, you have more than thousand systems or probably five thousand systems, right? What size is there? Have you, I mean, kind of any time have you, have you checked that or have you ever tested that? Or uh, if you can recommend any any size when systems are somewhere around five thousand systems, I mean, that's just an example. Yeah, so when we did this testing, I think I tested this on um, I tested this on many thousands of systems, and that's actually where we came with this this fifty number. It should be good for a large number of systems. But I was just saying, if you have a system with many thousands of hosts, um, it starts getting tricky because you know we don't know um, like how much compute power your servers have, and then there might have been variability in our testing. Um, because we just did some very basic performance testing from the development side, or at least that's what I did. Um, so that's 50 should be a good default, even if you have thousands, but I was just suggesting it might be interesting to try tuning it. Okay, got it, thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Has anyone else any questions, any comments for Ian? Uh, so Ian, like uh, with respect to applicability, like if I know you didn't go over like module streams or RADA, but with those things also the applicable RADA can be different, right? Like depending on what modules you have installed in your host, et cetera. Um, yeah, so we actually, the RADA, um generation and actually here let me just i can pull the code up real quick so the core of it is still yeah the rpm content ids but okay you are right the modules do have an effect on what rpms you say are applicable because module streams um will limit the scope of which rpms are applicable um and yes yeah, that's a good reminder Thanks, Partha. So um, I just, yeah, it, was, it is good to make that clear too. Um, but packages are still sort of the, the heart of it. And if you ever want to look at the code, again, um, we have this applicable, applicable content helper for anyone who's interested. Um, and yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Does that sound like what you expected, Partha? Yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, I just wanted to, I, I knew Paul too did that, so I just wanted to make sure that got in. Yeah, yep. Cool. Okie doke, any other questions about applicability? Don't all speak at the one time. Okay, then, Ian, thank you very much for this session. I found it particularly informative. Um, and if you do think of a question for Ian after this session, please write to us 
on our discourse. Um, and okie doke, I'll just stop the recording.